Uh, malware 3D visualization. Please give him a warm round of applause. Engineering goes to the left. 
And furthermore, you can obfuscate these executables. So you can take this code on the left, um, and the compiler does things like it takes out variable names, uh, assuming that the debugging uh, features are off, uh, comments, uh, if it had any, and the original structure of the code and mangles it a little bit to what we're looking at. Um, and then furthermore, what we can do is we can take the, uh, the thing called a packer or any sort of other obfuscations and further jumble it up to make it, uh, make it harder to look at. And so what we're fighting against is information loss, especially for packing. Um, as far as packers, um, I run the website Offensive Computing, and uh, based on about 3.6 million samples, the ones of those uh, samples of those that are packed, um, this is typically the breakdown. And, and primarily, uh, UPX is the is the most predominant packer that's out there, followed by ASPack, FSG, EcomPack, and ASPack. So does anybody have an idea why UPX is roughly 50% of all packed malware? Free? Okay, free is a good answer, but free. Um, anybody else? It's open source, you can with it. Right, it's open source and you can F with it, and also... Um, Everybody uses it, even for legitimate purposes, like Java? Sort of, yeah. Um, there's, there's an interesting side note about that, but I'll try not to get to real. So the reason that everybody uses it is because it's one of the only ones that actually works. <laughs> if you start looking at some of these other boutique examples of uh, packers and stuff like that, especially when we start getting into the little sliver section over there, um, you know, the, the ones that everybody knows about, that's a fairly easy thing to automate, and there's lots of things that have been talked about about how to automate them. But when we start to get into the little end of the drugs of this, we get into the manual deobfuscation. And so this is stuff where somebody has actually manually written a, um, a tool from scratch, usually handwritten in assembly, to go through and, and unpack this. So, and that's where you get comical mistakes too, but uh, alas, it's not part of this either. Okay, so Vera, this is a visualization tool for reverse engineering. It's specifically made to handle the, you know, the quick understanding or cognition of a, a program. Basically, this is all a force-directed graph, so uh, mathematicians in the audience asking what the x and y axis are, they, they don't mean anything. Um, uh, basically, it helps you determine where to start the reverse engineering process. And the whole idea behind this is to cut down on the reverse engineering time and make unpacking a little bit easier. So I'll go through a little bit of it. Um, <clears throat> so this is the 2D interface. Uh, this is the point three release. This is a network trace of the, um, of the notepad executable as it's running. Leave this right. Um, and so we start out in the uh, lower left hand corner, the, the blue, our uh, dark blue uh, flag indicates the start of execution. And then as we see each instruction execute, uh, we just make a note of that. And then uh, the results of that are built into a, um, a directed graph, which is then applied to a force directed algorithm uh, through the open graph display framework, and then displayed. So uh, this is a nice navigatable interface, so you can actually zoom in here. Um, and, and get an idea of the uh, overview. So the, the basis behind a lot of this is that you can find uh, loops, and uh, loops come out fairly easily in other programming constructs. So since this is looking at the dynamic behavior of what's going on inside of the executable, we've got the loops. Um, the yellow colors uh, indicate normal code, and I'll talk about what normal is in just a minute. And the green uh, loops indicate that there's a uh, API call that happens. And then the more times a, uh, a series of instructions are executed, the thicker the lines are drawn and we go through it. So if we zoom in here, this is basically the, the end result of what we're looking for. Uh, you can see this is inside the init term code of a normal Windows executable. Uh, but this is just like a, si a simple for loop and actually it's the Windows equivalent of processing uh, the main arguments to a program. So you see the get main args and then init term and so forth. <coughs> Okay, but zooming in on other parts of the graph, you can actually start to see other structures. So, uh, being that this is Notepad, it's actually going to respond to events from the executable or from the user that's going to be typing in. So, you would expect there to be a, you know, if they press control and X, that means they want to, you know, cut or whatever. Um, this is going to be inside of a switch statement that we're going to pull out. So, inside of here, we've got a switch statement where we've got a lot of things going towards that central node and a lot of fanning out. So, this is uh, this is a basic area here. 
Um, the colors, uh, what they mean is uh, basically these are meant to help you with unpacking, and I'll illustrate this in just a moment. But um, essentially, yellow means normal, uncompressed, low entropy data. Uh, and so for uh, the entropy calcu calculation, I'm using the Shannon entry, entropy or P log B. Um, dark green means that there's a section that's not present inside of the executable module. Uh, either it's a DLL or an API or something. Uh, light purple means the size of raw data is zero. Uh, dark red means it's a high entropy, so anything about above a 7.5 I mark as dark red. Light red means that the instructions are not in the original packed executable. And line green means the operands don't match. So you had a question, yes? Did you pick those colors because they helped in particular with your analysis, or are they basically random? Well, OK, so the question is, did I pick the colors because they help with analysis? And I would like to say yes, um, but you know the randomness is sort of there. Uh, but you know, being a typical male, I have no sense of color or aesthetics. So I, I won't claim that they look good. But that was sort of the end goal. Um, but yeah, I. Uh, there is an alternate set for those of you that are colorblind um, because a friend of mine took a look at this and said that's great, but everything's brown. Um, <laughs> except for you know, one of them. But, uh, anyway, so there is an alternate set and, and you can get this. But for this uh, demonstration, I'm going to use the lens that's original view. And so I hope that you can see some uh, transitions if that affects you. My apologies. Okay, so to actually reverse engineer this or apply this into your malware reverse engineering process, uh, you basically run this trace inside of a virtual machine. So originally we started out with the Ether system uh, written by Artem Dynaberg and Ether's awesome and great and that, and that sort of thing. But Ether's, Ether's gotten a little complicated lately uh, to install and um, you know most reverse engineers that I talk to, you know, they're very comfortable with using the VMware type approach and actually getting their information that way. So um, anyway, there's a new Intel PIG module uh, that was released last year that collects all this information for you and makes it a lot easier. So you don't have to have a big uh, Ether infrastructure or a custom install to inbox on an old version of Debian that's not supported anymore. Okay, so this is Coopface. Uh, we start in the upper left-hand corner. And you can see that um, uh, there's a dark red portion or a dark area of executables. This is actually the packer. And I'll go into how you actually determine what is the packer in these a little bit later, but um, this is a, uh, what a UPX packer looks like. When you generate these graphs, there's going to be different layouts, but essentially the overall form or the types of loops are going to be uh, pretty much the same. So if we look at the, um, I have a pointer here, but if we look at the, uh, the upper left-hand corner, there's a main set of thick loops right there that's the decompression portion of the of the UPX factor, and then the secondary loops are the import restoration. And then finally, we end up at the, um, the transition, which is the original entry point. And essentially, the transition to the original entry point is going to be the, the new colors that show up. Um, after that, towards the center, there's going to be a long initialization. Okay, look up here. Yeah, this is really hard to follow on the back. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Oh, thanks. thanks. You're awesome. Okay, so this is the UPX packer. This is the decompression point, uh, and this is the basically the import restoration code. Um, and then we've got the initialization, and then right here there's a transition between the red and the uh, light purple portions. Uh, that's the original entry point. Basically what you're looking for in any of these unpackers is a transition, uh, or the last transition to one of these colors. So in this case, we've got this light purple section, which if you remember is where the uh, data is allocated in the original executable but not present. So when the uh, executable loads up, it decompresses itself into this uh, area that it's set aside and then starts executing it. And then we have the, uh, the execute, uh, main execution. So this little initialization portion is going to be something that you see a lot inside of Windows executables. This is standard compiler boilerplate that's going to find the, uh, uh, the, the standard compiler boilerplate that you'll find this little pigtail here is going to be a, another indicator. And so pretty much from about here on is where you can start looking at the executable. Um, we've got the initialization. Now we want to start finding various areas of the executable. So each one of these long running strands right here is going to represent either a function or an area of uh, functionality. Basically, uh, there's an interface where you can right click and find it inside of IDA. 
Okay, so we've got the DLL uh, procedure letter for doing handling the imports again for the, the sec uh, secondary method of obfuscating imports, and then we've got the service installer and then the payload startup, uh, and of course the file injection. <coughs> but uh, Coopface behaves a lot differently when you actually get it installed. So uh, when it started as a service, it has a completely different execution and behavior. We've got the initial UPX packer, uh, which is gonna have some of the similar dimensions that you'll see. We've got the original entry point, which happens in the same place. The uh, executable preamble, which is gonna contain the uh, initialization code. And then things get a lot more, uh, more complicated. So if we look at the previous example versus this example, it's a lot more going on inside of here. So that's just a cue that lets you know that something else is happening. Um, and again, we're just going to look for these long running loops of execution, find these various places, and then using this, we can start identifying where things are. So if you remember uh, Coopface, uh, if anybody has been hit by it or have relatives that have been uh, popped by it, it's, uh, it's your ultra conservative mother in law who posts pictures of some girl getting her butt spanked about something or other. Uh, that's the, the common thing for Coopface, and we all giggle. Go on. But anyway, it's basically trying to spread itself and convince people to click on that. Uh, the primary attacks are against Facebook, MySpace, uh, Vivo, uh, those sorts of things. So it's all the all the major ones. Uh, we've got um, the command and control code, the call home, and then it's Google search to actually work on it. Okay. All right, but that's all old stuff. So what I would like to talk to you about now are some of the new features. So. Um, Somebody else? All right. <laughs> kind of afraid of that mouse. <laughs> All right, so I have here a picture of a standard reverse engineer in his normal everyday setting. Um, <laughs> um, and I'd like, to, I'd like to introduce the 3D features to talk to you about. So the uh, reverse engineer is going to get ready. <laughs> so we got this here. So let's, uh, let's pull this down. Give me just a second to get this start up. So what this is, is it's exactly the same sort of tracing mechanism. We're not picking out anything else. Uh, but what we're using is this uh, system called UbiGraph, uh, which if you've ever played with it, is, is an absolutely fantastic 3D layout algorithm. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about more about that and get proper credit. Uh, but inside of the system, you can actually uh, start the maneuvering around and navigate, and you can actually set it to spinning and that sort of stuff. So um, there we go. Uh, that's it. It's a little bit bright here to see it, but uh, essentially what it is is it's a, a 3D force directed layout placed on the uh, Fruckman and Reingold uh, calculations with a, a little bit of smoothing. Um, and we can actually do some navigation, so it's a little hard to do it sideways, but um, you can see some of the original structure that's going to come inside of this, uh, this program here. But in, and this is, again, this is the initial uh, coop face infection system. And uh, this is how it's installing itself. So we've got this uh, various beach ball structures. Really just... there we go. So you can zoom in and out. Um, you've got the start area here. We need more lumens. Yes? So uh, this is two points represent this piece of memory. Um, the, the adjacency of two points that are connected by an edge means that there was uh, consecutive execution between the two of them, uh, but the distance doesn't actually imply anything other than the spring and, and uh, attraction forces. Okay, but the uh, start, uh, this over here is basically going to bring this out. 
Okay, so this is the this is the 3D view that uh, we've got, and we've got the, the same uh, basic interface as we have on um, on the other system. So let me show you some other um, another set of graphs. Essentially, what the interface is to UbiGraph is an XML RPC. Um, it has, if you've ever done any sort of graph layout, this is uh, this uses the exact same things that you would use to um, uh, basically lay out a graph initially. And, and those things, you add your edges, you add your vertices, and then you tell it how it's connected. And then the UbiGraph system actually goes through and makes a, a series of good decisions about how to display it. Okay, so. Um, this is basically the exact same thing that we're looking at, uh, that we were looking at previously. Um, and you can navigate through it. So, um, one of the problems with UbiGraph or, or any of these 3D visualizations that uh, I actually ran into is that you get into a situation where they, they actually sort of look good in their cloud, cloud, cloud pleasers. Um, usually, well, like management gets really impressed with this. Um, <laughs> Uh, but when you, when you start looking at it, they get complex really quickly. And so the advantages and disadvantages that you find versus a 3D um, visualization uh, versus not are somewhat different. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a threat that was uh, basically an internal one that hit us uh, from a targeted group. Executing through them, uh, or executing them inside of UbiGraph, and then building them out. We start to build these connections here. Now, do the colors have the same meaning as what you've given it for? Exactly the same. Yes. Um, so we start to build this, but the problem is, is that inside of here, you, you sort of have to go through and mess around with this to actually start building any sort of uh, idea or mental map about what's going on. And what's really nice about the 2D system is that you don't necessarily have to uh, be as involved with it as ever. You do a much more passive look at it. Okay. But this just gives you an idea of some of the other things that were going on. But it's still very complicated uh, to look at. Now, if we look at the, um, shut this down here, and we're just gonna look at the 2D version Now that I don't work on Mac and Linux, 
um, and it's going to be integrated into the, um, the Vera GUI for export. Um, if you're interested in UbiGraph, um, there is a good talk from, uh, or a good paper from a guy named Todd Bellevue. Um, but for the life of me, I can't find him. Um, I, of course, have emailed him. I've uh, tried to track him down. I've tried to track him down through his advisor. Um, I knew a guy who was in Canada where he was supposedly living, and he was not home. Um, <laughs> um, and that sort of thing. So, Todd, if you're listening, uh, if you would, please contact me. Uh, there are people that would like to give you money. So, um, if you're looking for the address, it's this you buy any lab. Uh, it's actually very, very good, and there's a there's a great paper about it, which gives you all sorts of stuff. So if you're in graph drawing, okay. So let's get into uh, temporal visualization. Um, so these are the new features of uh, Vera that we're gonna we're gonna start looking at. So um, why is time important to reverse engineering? So understanding the flow of events usually uh, it helps to reconstruct what the program's doing. So when I, when I get the query by a customer who wants to ask what's going on with a, a piece of uh, malware, you know, they want to sort of know what, what's happened at what time and uh, what, what's happening. So in the case of Mebru, if you guys remember this one, um, Mebru was a, uh, one of the first master boot record infectors uh, that came on in a long time. So there's an initial 30 minute busy loop that happens. And usually when you run it, it just basically chews through your CPU and you don't have much uh, to do with this. So the, the question that you ask yourself is, is the malware broken or is it actually working? And basically you want to check and see that it's uh, uh, functional and persistent. So um, what I did is I took a trace of it, ran it, and it turns out that yes, it does work uh, due to the complaint that I got from my uh, IT staff about me being infected with malware. Um, but anyway, complicated uh, samples can get obfuscated very, very quickly. Um, so what I would like to do is uh, show you a couple examples of these, uh, these tools here uh, to just illustrate a little bit of it. So let's take that same uh, coop face trace. It's going to take a little bit of time to uh, load up, but this is essentially the exact same thing. Um, if we explore around inside of this, uh, this, this trace here, we've got the start section, we've got this high entropy area, so it doesn't look like it's actually a, um, uh, a known packer. Uh, but inside of here, you can see that there's some interesting things. Like one of the things is, is that there's an execution to a null memory address. So if you've ever looked at a piece of malware, one of the tricks that they'll try and do is they'll, they'll generate exceptions and try to crash the program uh, to, uh, to get it to go. And one of the things you can do is by dereferencing a null pointer. And so what, what uh, Coopface does is it uses the structured exception handler to inst instigate one of these bugs and get around it. Uh, but then there are two branches out, outwards, and then we've got the actual uh, initialization and uh, installation portions of this. But one of the things you don't really get a good idea of is where is the, uh, the temporal action? Or like what, what happens at what time? So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, I'm going to run it. Basically what I've done is I've taken a trace. I've taken a log of everything that's being executed. And I'm watching it as it's uh, doing there. And I use this to build an animation. So uh, we'll push the play button now. And you can see that there's a, a little portion of uh, uh, execution that's being filled out inside of the main visualization so you can see where the, uh, the program is headed, what's being executed when, and it gives you a better idea. You can actually navigate and see what's going on. So it's a little bit difficult to see, but it's, uh, it's inside of there. Um, this isn't necessarily the, uh, the best example of this. Uh, this is a fairly simple algorithm for actually developing the, uh, the animation portion. But uh, where things actually get a little bit more complicated is when you're looking at a sample that is, is based on some actual commercial code. So I'll go ahead and bring that up. So we have this, uh, uh, this uh, document that was sent to us. We're basically trying to get people to click on it. Get a little bit for it to load 
here. Um, and essentially, this is one of those things where it says, you know, there was a, a targeted attack to somebody inside of our company that was uh, sort of trying to figure out what was going on. And, and we get this right here, right? Um, so in the visualization field, this is something that's called a yarn ball. Um, it's not very useful, and it's a little bit difficult to actually figure out what uh, what's happening where. You can actually zoom in inside of here and get a little bit better idea of uh, uh, what's happening, but for the most part, it's not it's not going to be a consistent view. Okay, but with the animation. Um, with the animation, you can start picking it apart and getting the actual information that you need very, fairly quickly. So, um, it's going here. So the trace files uh, result in a little bit bigger data, so it takes a little bit while, uh, longer to load. There we go, that even looks better. But uh, when we're trying to track what's being loaded when, uh, we can use the animation and uh, we get a little bit better uh, grasp about what's going in here. So you can see where it's actually executing inside of this area and the areas that it's actually uh, running through. So this allows you to uh, narrow in uh, a little bit closer on, on what's available inside of here. Okay. All right, so that's the animation view and you can use that. Uh, primarily, this is this is important, especially when you get into uh, reverse engineering commercial software. Commercial software tends to be a little bit more difficult than, uh, than uh, uh, malware to, to look at. There's a lot more code to look at. Uh, question in the back. Yeah. Uh, have you thought about when you do the uh, internal display and as you go through it, uh, to get rid of the yard ball, just kind of like display it as it happens? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, there are some. Uh, so the question is, have I thought about uh, uh, displaying each node as it's being executed um, so that it's a little bit easier to see? Yeah, that's that's definitely something that's uh, that's in there. There's a couple of trade-offs that I'm working through. It'll be uh, different in the final release, but essentially what uh, what we're trying to, or what I'm trying to uh, fight with is that if you just do a one-by-one -one visualization of everything that's being executed, there's an awful lot of loops inside of here, and you'll just you end up staying inside of the loops for a little bit. A little so I'm just trying to uh, get past that and still provide some sort of idea about how things are executing. So typically what I'll do is I'll just only go through a loop once uh, and anything that. I hope that was a close question. Okay. Okay. So um, the next thing is the search feature. This is a commonly requested feature based off of what we were uh, what we were looking at, basically people, um, you know, it's a really good interface to go from Vera to the actual Ida GUI, uh, but also vice versa. So this allows a, a synchronization there, and it reduces some of the hunting and, and searching for a lot of the APIs, and it, it helps out a little uh, faster code discovery. I'll, uh, I'll show that in a little minute when we start looking at the unpacker. Okay, so as far as visual unpacking, um, it's, if, if you know how to unpack a file, it's, it's fairly trivial to actually be able to uh, figure out how to do it. There's some known techniques using the you know, push AD and pop AD and that sort of thing. Where you get into a lot of trouble is when you have an unknown packer or something that's not necessarily unpacking code or obfuscating and you need to figure out uh, what's actually happening. So I'm just going to go through an example of how to use this on a completely new custom written packer uh, for the poison IV variant. Um, there's automated methods, again, Ether's awesome, PolyUnpack, uh, those sorts of things. They do a really good job, but this is sort of for when those fail. So um, as for the, the code here, we've got the architecture of a packer. Um, we've got a malicious packed executable, so uh, typically we start out, there's a little, um, you, uh, the packer starts out with the initial compiled code, and then there's a small unpacking component that's uh, basically take, uh, taped on at the beginning. <coughs> And the entry point is patched to be uh, patched to go to the unpacking code. Um, as the unpacker executes, it's going to decode and then finally pass everything back to the uh, the unpack code. And so, what what the fundamental flaw that we're exploiting inside of any sort of unpacking system is that we are waiting for the unpacker or the decompressed code to actually pull out 
uh, the CPU instructions because an Intel CPU can't uh, actually execute anything but valid code. All right. Um, some other notes about Packers. It's extremely rare that malware is written in pure assembly. Uh, you saw this uh, sort of at the beginning of the 2000s and late 90s and that sort of stuff. That's when there was some really clever uh, methods for uh, writing a piece of malware. Certainly on the demo scene, a lot of those are, are custom written and they're going to be pretty highly tuned assembly. Uh, so you'll see a lot of those uh, inside of there. But um, most malware, especially the commercial malware that's going out there and trying to steal money, is, is a commercially written piece of software. And if you look inside of it, you're actually gonna find software quality and that sort of thing, test harnesses and that sort of thing, which means that it's written by a compiler. So after the compilation process and after the testing process, you'll have a, uh, you'll have a uh, software that's ready to be deployed and then these obfuscations are added on uh, past that. So UPX is one of them. Um, uh, that's added on and so forth, okay? Um, so if we look at, this is sort of a uh, display of some of the packers that are actually outside of there. Um, we start out with our, our packer on the bottom left-hand side at the start. Um, this is the UPX packer, has the same sort of overview of it, uh, but there's some standard, uh, uh, standard functionality that exists inside here, but we've got a good transition from the dark red to the light purple. Uh, and again, dark red is high entropy, and the light purple is the uh, size of broad 8 equals 0. Um, OEP is a transition from the dark red to the light purple, uh, we can find. Uh, ASPAC, this is uh, another one here. ASPAC is actually uh, low entropy code as far as what's going on, but it decrypts everything in place. And then we have a final transition. Um, a final transition to the unpack code, and then we start the actual uh, execution inside of there. Okay. FSG, which is another one of the popular ones. Again, we have the small loops right here. Um, we have the uh, import restoration code, and then the main executable being run here. Uh, this, aside from the colors being mismatched, this is very, very similar to the UPX unpacker. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is one of the um, uh, slide ones. Okay, so as far as staged unpacking, uh, in this case, we've got a start component here. Uh, this is where we start inside of a code that's outside of a section uh, that does initial decompression. This uh, encrypted code is, is something that was compressed uh, or encrypted before, and then finally we got here. So this is basically a staged unpacker, which is mu, uh, before we actually get into the uh, executable code. Uh, and then the final one I would like to show you is TLOC. TLOC is uh, a fairly complicated one. We start out with normal code to do the unpacking and basically go through this um, process to unpack, decode itself, and then start re-executing sections. So it makes it a lot more complicated, but eventually we get through it and we're able to trace it. When we look at automated unpacking, um, automated unpacking uh, is essentially this algorithm. Um, if you look at a lot of the research that's been out there, the first thing that we're going to do um, is that we need a system that's going to watch and uh, look at what the actual instructions executing. Um, and essentially what we're looking for is the, is the instruction writing to memory. If it's writing to memory, then log it. Um, and then the very next step we do is to check and see if the uh, is EIP actually executing inside of a previously written address. If it is, then it's going to dump the uh, process. And this is basically the entirety of, of how a lot of the automated systems work. Um, so you need a system that actually tracks memory rights and executions. And once you've got that, uh, you've pretty much got a system to, uh, to do this. Um, a lot of the differences among the solutions that are out there are basically differences in how you monitor. All right, so um, as a reverse engineer, one of the things that I do is I actually uh, have to unpack a fairly robust set of uh, other other examples. So what I would like to do is I'd like to show you how to use uh, Vera uh, to accomplish this. So we're just going to start up Vera again. Get the mouse on the right side of the screen. Okay. So what this is is a uh, it's a copy of the Poison ID uh, variant. And over here on my virtual machine, I have my elite um, reversing setup. You can, you can tell because it has a cool picture in the background. Uh, 
So we, I'll start off, this is the malware uh, downloaded fresh from offensive computing. If we start looking inside of uh, IDA Pro, um, you know, essentially there's not a whole lot to this. So the, the point of this is that this actually got into the, uh, the unpack code um, and a lot of this is not actually present. And